Can you hear me all right? No, <laughs> they cannot. How about this? What's a good number for the mic level? Eight? More or less? I can't, yeah, okay, perfect. Just um, go ahead. I can hear better the voice, so hopefully this will work. Okay, better? Okay, great. So hello everyone, um, welcome. Uh, welcome to the College of Architecture and Design at the Lawrence Technological University. And welcome to those joining online through our YouTube channel. My name is Sara Kodarin and I'm an assistant professor of architecture. At the college, we believe that the future of design is multidisciplinary and we host a range of design degrees that include graphic design, industrial and transportation design, game design, interiors, and architecture. We track design future trends, emerging technologies, and advancements in practice as a means of cra crafting education approaches in these areas. Our design technology lecture series allows us to engage in design discussions and offer broad perspectives on where we're headed. So our next lectures will take place. The first one, uh, this Thursday, March 30th, uh, Julian Bleeker will present design fiction. The second one is on April 11th, and Dana Kukova will present on politics of uh, ecological intimacy. You can sign up using the flyers on the tables or through our COAD lecture page. Now, I'm very excited to introduce today's speaker of our Spring 2023 Design Technology Lecture Series, Frank Melendez. Frank Melendez is an architect and educator practicing in New York City. Frank is an assistant professor at the City College of New York's Peter School of Architecture. Frank is the author of the book Drawing from the Model, Fundamentals of Digital Drawings, 3D Modeling, and Visual Programming and Architectural Design. By the way, you guys should be familiar with this publication. It's a great book and something that I would highly recommend, and I can't wait to have this signed. Um, Frank has published texts uh, that focus on the role of responsive technologies in architectural design and educational pedagogies. His works have been supported through grants and fellowships, including the 2020 NYSCA Grant Award sponsored by the Van Allen Institute, the McDowell Colony, in which has, uh, he was awarded 2017 Artist in Residence Fellowship. Frank has held ac academic appointments at Carnegie Mellon University, as well as Louisiana State University and Arizona State University. Frank holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Arizona and a Master of Architecture from the Yale School of Architecture. His professional experience includes working at Urban a and in New York and Frank Gehry and Associates in Santa Monica, California. So I am responsible for the technology sequence in the college and I require all my students uh, to read the chapter Data and Computation from the book Data Matter Design, another book that I would like to mention, as a way to introduce and frame digital workflow in architectural design, and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to discuss some of these things today. Um, today, Frank will speak on unruly matters, uh, and at the end of the lecture, we'll have time so, so for a 15-minute Q&A session. So, the floor is yours, and please help me welcome Frank Melendez. Great, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Sarah, Carl, and Andrea for the introduction, invitation to speak here today, and the warm welcome on behalf of LTU. It's an honor to be part of your Spring Lunch and Learn lecture series, which includes a great lineup of speakers um, this semester and in the past. I've titled today's lecture, Unruly Matters, and I'll be presenting some of the work and research from my practice, Biomatters, and concluding with some work from an advanced architecture studio where I teach at the Spitzer School of Architecture, City College of New York. Our work at Biomatters focuses on a framework for designing and making with natural materials, upcycled waste, and living organisms in tandem with computation and digital fabrication technologies. 
We employ various computational techniques to study emergent behavior and growth patterns, and our process includes growing and observing various living organisms. The work explodes, explores notions of, of a post-digital craft that merges code, machines, and robotics with natural and living material qualities, characteristics, and behaviors. It aims to merge computational precision with the unruliness of living matter and attempts to blur the physical digital dichotomy to generate novel and emergent expressions of form, pattern, geometry, and aesthetics within architecture and design. Biomatters is a startup company that was founded a few years ago by myself and my partner, Nancy Denish. We integrate biomaterial research and biofabrication workflows to develop domestic products and architectural systems using these various unruly materials. Biomatters stems from a broader body of work and research within our practice, Augmented Architectures in which we develop projects that operate in between the human body and architectural scale, engaging topics pertaining to biotechnology, digital and biofabrication, computational design, virtual reality, interactive design, data visualization, 3D printing, and robotics. We create interactive installations, wearable devices, sustainable material systems and drawings as extended notions of architecture, and we have exhibited some of these, this work at various events. So this image shows our interest, the interface between living organisms and the built environment, a mutualistic relationship between the two, and the complex interconnectedness of the organic and inorganic. It's evident in the era of the Anthropocene that the Earth's ecosystems have been drastically impacted and affected by humankind. The results of climate change threaten our human survival as well as other species on the planet. This has sparked a global call for change in action to address global warming, the destruction of forests, and the depletion of natural resources, to name a few and has been expressed through social, political, and cultural systems, such as the 2019 Youth Strike for Climate March in NYC, where Greta Thun Thunberg spoke prior to the United Nations Climate Summit. In addition to activist methods that minimize energy consumption, lower the carbon footprint, reduce the amount of biodegradable, biodegradable materials, and end up in landfills. According to the UN program 2022 Global Status Report for Building and Construction, current construction materials rely on energy-intensive, mineral-based extractive processes and end-of-use phase of building systems, materials which are often wasted. This has a negative impact on our environment, contributes to the loss of biodiversity, and produces approximately 100 billion tons of waste generated annually, 35% of which is sent to landfills. What's our responsibility as architects and designers in address addressing our built environment in the age of climate crisis? Within our research framer framework, we look toward a model of biodigital materiality which lies at the intersection of biosystems, integration, biocrafted tools and techniques, biogrown, human grown for specific purposes, and biotic abiotic hybrid systems, artifacts, materiality, and which is encompass encompassed by circularity, multi species, non human centric, grown design systems, waste, and awareness. Some of the living organisms that we work with include fungi, mycelium, bacterial cellulose, microalgae, cyanobacteria, physarum polycyphalum, aka slime mold, bacteria, and lichens. Analyzing their capacity to grow, metabolize, respond, adapt, and reproduce. Our work falls within a larger network and growing community of architects, designers, scientists, artists, and others who are interested in designing with living systems, 
and who are working at the intersection of art and architecture, science, and technology. This image highlights a few of these individuals and teams who have been developing biointegrated design research and projects over the past few decades. In our process, we use computational design techniques to simulate natural patterns, geometry, and forms. These digital models allow us to analyze the morphologies of various natural systems in two-dimensional and three-dimensional models and create versions based on input parameters and forces that act upon them. These works are from a series titled Artificial Natures that explores uncanny emergent formations that are based on computational algorithms and that simulate growth in pseudo-natural pseudo systems as well as unanticipated and unexpected results, glitches and mutations. Throughout civilization, uh, fired clay has taken on various roles, ranging from utilian, utilitarian objects to decorative art. From the earliest days of architecture in various parts of the world, earth, mud, and clay materials have been used in the fabrication of structures and the production of architectural ornament. In our work with clay, we use computation in tandem with digital fabrication technologies to experiment with how materials can be shaped while allowing for material expression. This work goes back several years. In this early project, we were 3D printing parts that were used to make molds for slip casting using slip, which is a clay slurry, that would be poured into the mold, left for a duration of time, and then the excess slip is poured out of the mold, resulting in a thin shell of clay. I show this project as an early example of a liquid material that is challenging to shape and an early use of 3D parametric models that allowed for very variegated pattern on surface. These ceramic vessels were glazed to have various surfaces and finishing effects. And the slip casting process allows for multiple identical pieces to be made using a single mold. However, with advances in 3D printing, our current work revisits clay through additive manufacturing processes that allow for customized parts and eliminates the mold making process. Clay is a pliable, malleable material that can undergo plastic deformations which, when fired, undergoes a transformation that hardens, resulting in ceramics. Using parametric tools allows for multiple iterations to be explored and generated. And while, while the clay 3D printing process allows for those iterations to be realized, and here are a few examples of these various features printed at various scales and with various patterns that allows the clay to express uh, the, the plasticity. And using these various glazing techniques to highlight pattern variation through gradients. These are some recent pieces that were exhibited at Coleco Gallery in Brooklyn from a show called Varied Vessel that we were invited to participate in. As a natural material, Clay offers a more sustainable approach to design, as opposed to synthetic and environmentally detrimental materials that are often used in today's buildings and products. Gramazio Kohler of the ETH recently stated, quote, it was only with the advent of industrialization processes that the material clay was replaced and discarded and associated with primitive ways of building. Environmental concerns and the pressures of climate change have been rescuing the material, which is carbon neutral, and it has returned to the center of architecture's interest. Another glazing technique that we have explored recently is raku, which allows for the unexpected results that emerge from the process of firing. By removing the glazed ceramic pieces from the kiln while they are still glowing red hot and placed into combustible, combustible materials such as paper, in a closed container which removes oxygen. This results in a range of colors and effects. So these are some different examples of some of our pieces. Um, 
using generative modeling techniques that are 3D printed and finished with Raku fire glazing. In this piece here, this is a Raku fired piece without glaze and a computational simulation of some of the techniques that we use to generate the geometry and forms. <laughs> 3D printing is often planar, layers of materials that are built up. The following pieces use digital models that display Z values to create non-planar curves as tool paths. This allows for non-planar printing, which pushes and expands the clay material to produce undulating surfaces. So this allows us to kind of expand upon what we're able to do with layer, layers of 3D printing and create, express more of the plasticity of, and compression of, of clay. And here's one of those pieces and the, those details. In our work, we also look for opportunities to upcycle waste materials into objects and architectural systems. The eggshells in this image were collected from a local neighborhood restaurant that discarded them, which we then washed and cleaned, and ground into powder. Eggshells consist primarily of calcium carbonate crystals, which are also found in the shells of marine organisms, such as oyster shells. We're looking at a whole range of waste materials, such as coffee grounds, paper, sawdust, and many other domestic and industrial waste materials that are produced and typically discarded every day in our homes, neighborhoods, and cities. This waste is often placed in plastic bags, placed in trucks, and shipped to landfills, adding to, adding to environmental impacts of energy and cost. By upcycling and sourcing local waste materials and supply chains, we are questioning how much of this discarded material can be reduced, how it can be used in, for various applications, and testing composite materials that can be formed and shaped in different ways. This, combined with digital design and fabrication tools, opens up opportunities for designing objects and systems using waste-based biopolymer composites which can be reformed, reshaped, and repurposed through nozzle-based 3D printing methods. These materials contain specific attributes of texture, pattern, haptic qualities, and other architectural effects, which we are currently exploring in the design and fabrication of domestic objects and interior systems. This is an example of these artifacts from our Weave series. This project prototypes and speculates on the design of waste-based 3D printed modules. The individual module is, is textured and contains activated carbon to pull particulate matter from the air. Multiple modules can be stacked and rotated in various ways to form larger systems, for example, interior partitions and screens. And we're exploring these modules to create different types of forms and different assemblies. And with all of these examples, we try to speculate on what's possible through the components and assemblies, but also try to prototype these as a proof of concept. These waste materials can also serve as scaffolds for growing living materials. Calibrating a workflow where materials are selected based on a living organism and then sterilized and inoculated for colonization. We have applied this biofabrication process to the production of biopigments from different biological sources such as bacteria and algae. As opposed to synthetic chemical dyes, biological dyes are environmentally friendly due to their biodegradability. We extract pigments from bacteria such as serratia marcescens, that occurs naturally in soil and water, which produces, 
protozoan, a red pink pigment, and stock liquid cultures. We grow bacteria on culture plates and test them on various textiles. So these are some of the textiles that we dyed with a specific bacteria that produces a distinctive uh, violet color. And we're also testing them on various substrates, either inoculating the materials or mixing them after harvesting and pigment extraction. We also mix them with nutrient-rich hydrogels for 3D printing directly onto textiles. And these are some examples of our 3D prints uh, on, on textile fabrics. These begin to grow after approximately four days, and you can see the way they spread through a phenomenon known as quorum sensing. And we're also applying these similar workflows with algae. We grow and harvest red algae and blue-green algae, cyanobacteria. And this image shows the various steps in the process from growing the algae in bioreactors to extracting and mixing them with hydrogels. This video clip shows the process of extracting the algae, which we place into a centrifuge. This spins at various speeds, various RPMs, create, creating a centri centrifugal force that separates fluids from solids. After these pigments, after, after, after using these, um, after the extra extraction process, we use these pigments as natural dyes to add color to the various waste-based materials. So these are some examples of a prototype for a, a wall screen system that can be stacked and arranged in various ways to create larger assemblies. And we also work with fungi, in particular mycelium, which consists of a network of fungal threads called hyphae. Fungi is, a, is classified in its own kingdom, like plants and animals. And it plays an important role in energy cycling within and between ecosystems as decomposers that break down dead plants and animals. A single spore of mycelium can develop into a whole network which can sprout mushrooms, the fruiting body of fungi. We analyze mycelium in various ways, such as through time-lapse videos, showing the mycelium network growing on a culture plate over the duration of a few days, and through microscop microscopic photos and videos of the hyphae filament branches. We can explore the mass of branches and better understand how they maximize contact with food sources. The, the hyphae start to secrete enzymes when they search for food, which start to break down biological polymers. So this is an example of one of our microscopic images that really starts to depict the complexity of the mycelium network of hyphae. We try to explore these networks through digital models, computation, computational methods that attempt to simulate mycelium growth, allowing us to further study their patterns, networks, and formations. We have grown various strains of fungi on various culture, plate, and mediums. So we test out a lot of different types of strains, and we test these on different substrates that we formulate with various domestic and industrial waste materials. Mycelium networks grow primarily underground, and in this video clip, you can see some of the substrate material shifting as the material grows within and ultimately covers the substrate.
And this is an image of some of the various results that we've had growing mycelium on some of the different substrates. This study of a small sphere-shaped sphere -shaped module inoculated with mycelium shows a detail of how mycelium grows and binds together. So they are no longer discrete modules, but they're one continuous living entity that is bio-welded together. And this de demonstrates to us the amazing power of mycelium to bind waste as a natural glue and the potential to bio-weld the individual units together as a cohesive whole. We have also designed and created other types of objects and paneling systems with mycelium, exploring different textures and patterns that can be achieved by digitally fabricating various molds in which the mycelium is grown and formed. So in this example, we're designing patterns digitally and then using a CNC router to generate a mold in which um, the mycelium is cast. This is one of our early works using mycelium, titled Meander Series. It's an interior paneling system that can be arranged in a tessellated pattern. The surface of the geometry of these panels are computationally designed to increase and maximize surface area using a labyrinthian pattern of valleys and ridges. And the left and center renderings shows how we think about this system being applied to a larger surface area with the actual prototype on the right. This detail image just shows the texture of the mycelium pattern, which is intended to serve as an acoustically performative uh, module for sound sensitive environments along with activated carbon as an additive to remove any toxins from the air as an agent for bioremediation. So we explore this same uh, pattern using organic-based biopolymers at various scales with various pigments, opacities, and transparencies to produce different aesthetic effects. And we exhibited this work at the Biodesign Here Now exhibition at Open Cell part of the London Design Festival in 2019. These were also exhibited at Design for the Senses, Material Innovation Exhibition, London in 2020. The following works incorporate computational design and 3D printing workflows to fabricate a series of mycelium vessels in this time-lapse video, you can see the waste-based substrate that has been inoculated with mycelium and the growth after a period of approximately five days. During this time, the mycelium is kept within a sterile, sterile environment to avoid any type of contamination. Often there'll be mold or other contaminants that um, begin to grow within the, within the mycelium, so it needs to be really kept within a, a clean environment. Uh, the piece is then air dried over a few days, so we're basically trying to remove uh, and dehydrate the mycelium. Um, and we fire this at a low temperature also in an oven in order to extract all the uh, hydration from the piece. So you can see a result, some of the result of it while it is, it is living and growing, and then after it dies through the um, dehydration and, uh, process. This is another time lapse from our swell series vessels, showing an elevation view of the piece during the mycelium growth period. and some other images from a collection of vessels. Using different variables with 3D printing these pieces, such as calibrating the amount of waste-based material that can be built up from one piece. Often, as we're building the material, unlike clay, 
um, it has a tendency to fail, or there's only a, there's a certain limit as to how much you can build up the material. So th these are some of the things that we try to calibrate as we as we make these pieces and think about the structure and the geometry and how it starts to support um, building up building up material. We're also testing different textures, uh, cantilevering material. All of these things are affected by pressure, force that can be used during the printing period and produce different uh, patterns and effects. Uh, recently, we've been combining some of these techniques to produce a series of biohybrid pieces that merge mycelium, which e exhibit an off-white neutral tone with various al algae to add color. We're also testing ceramic as a bioreceptive material for growing algae, as opposed to mineral-based glazes and firing techniques. These pieces are placed within a, um, yeah, so th these are some of the different um, pieces where we're adding algae as the, as the biopigment. And we're also testing some of these, um, some of the algae material as a, using ceramic as a bioreceptive material for growing algae. So this is a uh, customized bioreactor, which allows the algae to grow within the grow onto the material. And we're firing the ceramic at a low temperature. So for those of you that work with ceramics, you know that when you fire ceramic at a very low temperature, it's still very porous. And at a very high temperature, it's less, it has less porosity. So we're firing at a temperature of cone, si cone 06, which is approximately 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature allows the ceramic to maintain porosity and allows the microorganisms to take hold within the, within the material. Also, these different creases from the layers of 3D printing um, further provide recesses recesses for the algae uh, to grow and kind of nest within that um, crease. So in addition to the vessels, we're also printing uh, these hybrid panels using mycelium and algae. These designs are based on shortest walk algorithms which yield emergent patterns. And this Continuous uh, undulation, undulating line of material is then bound together with the mycelium network, fusing separate, separated elements together. This creates an under, undulating surface texture that establishes a framework for mycelium growth that yields unpredictable outcomes. And additional layers are then added to the panels to introduce color. These are then assembled to form larger tie-line systems. So the same algorithm that we use to simulate the branching structure with layers of branches, um, we've used this to uh, reduce the amount of branching and build it vertically. And this results in a, three, a component that has a three-dimensional relief with the top layer um, being printed algae to highlight the branching effect. And these are some photos of these final pieces. And for us, the 3D printing process allows each panel to, to be unique. So there's a non-repetitive pattern that's produced for visual interest and aesthetics.
And the, the last uh, living organism that I'm going to be covering today is lichen. Uh, lichens are composite organisms that consist of algae, cyanobacteria, that lives within fungal networks in a mutualistic relationship. So it's a really interesting living organism that is combining, that, that is a combination of fungi and algae. The mycelium basically provides protection, houses the fungi, and the algae produces nutrients uh, for, the, for the fungi. Sorry, the mycelium provides protection for the algae, and the algae produces nutrients for the fungi. So according to the U.S. Forest Service, Department of Agriculture, there are approximately 3,600 species of lichen in North America, and new discoveries are being made every year. They are found all over the world in diverse habitats, habitats and clim climates. Lichen contribute to biodiversity. They are good indicators of air quality, and they allow algae to thrive in various climates globally, converting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere into oxygen through photosynthesis. At Biomatters and in my advanced design studio at the Spitzer School of Architecture last fall, we were finding and documenting lichen growth within New York City, specifically lichen that were growing on mineral-based mineral substrates such as stone, concrete, bricks, metal, etc. We're also collecting various species of lichen from various locations to test their growth on various um, to test their growth on ceramic substrates. So students in my fall semester began, we, we began by learning how to 3D print clay and teaching them how to generate tool paths and a kind of introduction to ceramics and glazing ceramics. We began um, to design and 3D print modules and the modules are intended to support and promote the growth of lichen. So this modular system by Philip Lee, Mingyao Cheng, and Kong Pei Sun was designed using digital modeling techniques to create a series of Boolean subtractions, allowing for indentations that would house the lichen with part of the module being glazed while the interior was left unglazed for lichen growth. The project speculates on the use of automating the process of transferring lichen spores onto the bioreceptive material through robotic processes. And they're using a brush as an end effector to transfer these spores from samples on the petri dish onto the modules. And these are some images of the final um, assembly prototype. Uh, this project by Amy Ho, Amy Ho Akanksha Mahajan, and Floram Zarku tests the plasticity of clay and gravitational forces to produce a webbing that protects lichen for growth. The, in this project, we were exploring robotic fabrication for glazing techniques. And this, um, this glazing technique was applied to ceramic modules and allowed us to uh, glaze in different, glaze modules in different ways. And here are some slides of their final prototype and assembly. Um, this system by Coco Mong, Lana Chan, and Farah Altabatabi focuses on a few modules that have various textures and, and patterns to increase bioreceptive surface area. And they're generating a series of different modules and using cellular automata processes to generatively um, stack and arrange the modules in different configurations. So this results in a 
various assemblies that can be produced. And here the robotic fabrication workflow was using a brush to automate the glazing process with a pr precise pattern of point locations. And this process is repeated several times by the robots in order to generate this uh, dot pattern. And the resulting um, pattern serves as a decorative element, kind of a tattoo on the piece that blends multiple pieces together visually and creates the kind of cohesiveness between the different modules. So this is a prototype of their final assembly. And a diagram that, which basically applied to all of the projects, um, but uh, in, the, in their diagram kind of illustrating this method for increasing biodiversity within urban environments. So at least within New York City, you know, uh, other, you know, outside of parks, and even in parks, if you look at a lot of the trees and, and vegetation, um, it's not the, the kind of in its healthiest state. So the idea, you know, is that we're, we're able to begin to apply some of these systems in urban spaces, dense spaces that are lacking um, biodiversity to uh, increase, the, increase that. And here's a prototype of their final assembly, which they positioned close to the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn, a highly polluted body of water, as a way to um, start to think about how this might um, enhance biodiversity there. Uh, this last project by Katerina Kwong, Tianyu Chen, and Kingsley Chong focuses on non-planar 3D printing techniques. Using non-planar toolpaths, which are on the left side, using the 3D printer, and on the right, robotic workflows. And they're using a simple pointing tool that they're using to uh, poke the clay and create indentations. So these indentations are intended to uh, place lichen spores and kind of house some of the lichen spores. And these areas are unintentionally left or intentionally left unglazed. Um, it also, by not glazing the piece, it allows for more porosity within the ceramic. And the, re the remainder of the module is left, is, is glazed. So the exterior is glazed in one color, and on the interior, they're glazing brighter colors um, because the brighter colors are facing an interior space. So this is intended to serve as a facade system that can be applied to existing glass curtain walls as a way to promote lichen growth and increase biodiver biodiversity on glass building facades. It also provides shading um, within large glass surfaces that are primarily facing south and receive a lot of direct sunlight. And here's the final prototype of their project. So we're in the process of continuing this research, collecting lichen from St. Nicholas Park in Harlem and in Long Island. And we're, again, just kind of collecting lichen from various miner mineral substrates. So in the parks, you see a lot of uh, granite, rocks, and other, other miner mineral substate, substrates. So we're collecting from these as the lichen are already kind of accustomed to growing on these types of surfaces. And we're documenting the samples at various scales to uh, track their growth. And these are some images of how we're collecting, collecting lichen. And we're testing out various growth medias. So we're applying these medias to different ceramic test tiles, testing out different um, recipes that will promote the lichen growth. And we're 
um, inoculating um, the media with lichen, which is then applied with a brush to these test tiles. And we've been positioning or placing these tiles in, in indoor environments along window sills where they're getting direct sunlight. We're also placing them on the exterior to see the difference in how they'll be um, growing or surviving within these different conditions. So this is um, for a current uh, project that's currently in the works. We're, uh, at Biomatters, we're designing a bioreceptive column that supports lichen growth. So these are some various design iterations of modules that we've been printing recently, which will be stacked to form a six foot tall column. And the form of the column is based on different growth algorithms and the texture expresses the uh, plasticity and the unruly behavior of the clay material while increasing bioreceptive surface area for lichen growth. Um, this will be for an upcoming exhibition titled Reordering Architecture, which focuses on 3D printing and clay, specifically with clay. And the participants include Biomatters, uh, Jonathan Shelsa with Greg Sh Sheward, uh, Shelby Doyle, and Kelly Van Dyke Murphy. So the exhibition will be held at Usagi Gallery in Dumbo, Brooklyn, which will run from May 5th to May 25th. So if you're in the New York City area during this time, please stop by to take a look. We'd also like to thank a few of the organizations that support our work and research. Uh, Central St. Martin's University of Arts London. This is where Nancy Denish teaches as the course leader of the MA Biodesign program, for those of you that are interested in maybe an MA in Biodesign. And the Spitzer School of Architecture, City College of New York, where I teach as an associate professor. And two incubators, FutureWorks NYC and New Inc., the New, New Museum's incubator uh, in New York City, which we have been supported by. You can find us on Instagram at Biomatters LLC and at Augmented Architectures. And I just want to say thank you again to LTU for the invitation and opportunity to share our work today. And thank you all for your attention. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, um, well, one, I think as sophomores who are using these tools already, I think that's really impressive. Um, you know, I think these technologies have existed for quite a few decades now, but they are continuing to uh, evolve and be more readily available. Um, you know, at least for me, starting off learning some of these technologies or even 3D modeling. Um, technology advances quickly, as you all know. And so I think, you know, I think that the future of fabrication, um, how we design and construct our built environments definitely integrates these technologies in various ways. Um, regardless of, of, you know, whether 
it is the same type of material that I've been presenting today or even standardized materials. I think there's a definitely a shift um, and, and also just to revisiting other materials that have uh, been discarded. I mentioned this in one of my slides about uh, materials such as clay that have, were, were discarded through industrialization um, processes in, in a certain sense and how these are being revisited through these new um, advances in technology. We have a question. Um, so you had mentioned like firing the printed clay at lower temperatures to keep it more porous. Um, do you think it'd be possible to kind of seed some of the fungi, like um, so like pyrophilus fungi into the clay? So when it's fired, it's activated afterwards to see that kind of growth? I mean my my initial thought with the firing is that it it basically will kill any living organism. So firing it, it would have to be a firing at a very low temperature in order to, um, in order to uh, allow any kind of living organism to live. Because for clay to actually um, become ceramic, it, it reaches a fairly high temperature one of the lower temperatures being cone 06, which is about 1800 degrees. But um, I think there are other ways of starting to think about outside of clay. Um, we're using clay as a, as a bioreceptive material now, but other, other types of earth materials, other types of soils and clays that maybe uh, don't need high firing, so I think that that's definitely something to explore. <laughs> Went so quiet. Are there any applications for creating interior walls for insulation? Can they be applied to basements or dark areas? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think uh, there's there's quite a bit of work that is already doing that using uh, mycelium um, panels for insulation and uh, whether it's through, for sound dampening or thermal control regulation. That's that's one of the earlier uses of mycelium. Um, in our work, we're, a lot of that work is often hidden within, within the wall. Uh, we're trying to think about other um, ways of expressing mycelium and, and rethinking kind of bioesthetics and what that means and, and what the opportunities are for um, not hiding the material, but allowing it to be visible and um, expressing that somehow. Yeah, I love that. O also because uh, like observing bacteria is a very precise scale of observation. So you can talk about growth, and I love the way this is informing like design ideas. So we have more time. <laughs> can you? you well, thanks for the, for the great presentation. Um, I, was, I was kind of taken by the, you started showing a number of animations and it made me kind of remember and appreciate the difference between let's say drawing by hand where maybe there's not a kind of feedback in the design process. And so a lot of your animations seem to show a kind of uh, computational feedback related to what's going on. And then as you moved into more of the material studies, it, it feels like there's an incredible resonance between a kind of feedback from a material or materials that we don't commonly use in architecture that are live materials, right? We're, we mm -hmm. often work with inert materials because their properties stay the same. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe your compu like the resonance maybe between the computational approach and the material approach and how those two things might feed one another. I think it's really, yeah. it's really exciting to see. 
Yeah, no, um, I, I mean, I think for me, that's one of the exciting things about working with these materials is that, that there is kind of a set of conditions that are put in place. And at some point, things fail. I, I'm showing a lot of work that has been um, more of our kind of uh, successful moments, but there's a lot of, a lot of things that happen contamination, things falling, things uh, that I, I probably wouldn't want to... Sh I, I was already a little worried as you were eating lunch, uh, having this lecture, but um, yeah, there's a lot of contamination. And so, um, but, but just in terms of the actual material and the feedback, that's something that I think is just really interesting and, um, and, and kind of setting up these conditions for the material to express itself. And I feel the same way with digital uh, computational design, um, setting in, um, kind of setting up a series of rules that begin to allow for unexpected outcomes or emergent kind of results. Um, so for me, I think uh, they're very related in a way, um, starting to kind of use both of those. I think it, it is challenging kind of finding ways to, uh, to bring some of these more it's very complex out, uh, 3D models into, um, a digit, into, a, into a fabrication process because they are very intricate, very complex. Um, but that's something that we are kind of continuing to work with and, and, and trying to find ways of, of um, merging and bridging these two methods together. I had one question. Um, I think that what you've been showing has been really fascinating. And one thing that I've seen uh, that's particularly intriguing to me is the way that you know, repurposing um, waste materials or even growing new uh, fabrication materials. I think that's really intriguing from a, an environmental standpoint. Um, but my question is, as we currently stand, what does that look like from an, uh, an economic standpoint? And what does the future of that look like? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, that's a great question. And I think there are, um, you know, I think, I think it's a very broad topic. So there's a lot of, there's questions about economics, um, it's political, it's social. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what the, the answer to that question is in terms of the, the financial implications um, in future, but I, I, I think, you know, there is cost involved, right? Um, and I think there is, a, there is current industrial ma ways of making that are continue that continue to be used, or different, um, let's say, synthetic materials that continue to be used because there's a cost or economy of scale in manufacturing them. Um, so I think it's it's really a, a kind of cultural shift that hopefully is is happening and that that needs to happen. Otherwise, I'm not sure. I mean, I think we can speculate on the future of our planet if we continue at the rate that we're going. But, um, but yeah, I think, um, I think when this cultural shift, can, as it continues to happen, that at some point the, the economic or costs will kind of offset um, and allow, allow for more of this type of um, approach to be implemented. design standpoint um, what so I know you mentioned briefly of like the acoustical properties and stuff like that how often is this used as acoustic properties in spaces and um, like yeah how how is it expanding on interior design not just because I know you can like 3d print houses and stuff but how does that work interior -wise? yeah so a lot of the a lot of the work where we're developing right now is really at a small scale. 
So I know there, there's a lot of great research that's happening with 3D printing at a really large scale, 3D printing houses, um, using concrete and earth. I think, um, you know, for us, these are our prototypes. We're really kind of testing out ideas. We're testing out possibilities for what interior paneling systems might might be. I mean, even looking up above our heads at the ceiling and thinking about standard materials that are used that are often, you know, applied for acoustics or um, or kind of controlling interior environments. I think there's a lot of materials that are you know, have been made a certain way for many decades that are very kind of environmentally unfriendly. And so for us, these are, it's more of a kind of opportunity st to start to rethink some of these interior systems that, we're, that, are, that are typically used today and how those can be, um, yeah, how, how we can, what are, what are the alternatives? What are some other, what, what are things that maybe we can't replace today, but maybe in future, things that we can replace today that are no longer um, healthy. I mean, we see this with things like asbestos, right? That there were products that were developed and made at a certain time that ended up being very hazardous to humans. And so a lot of these materials have been removed from buildings and are no longer in use. Um, but I think there's more we can do and more opportunities to kind of explore and, and be critical about some of the materials that we use today. Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I think we, you know, we definitely look at, at natural systems and it's hard not to be inspired by them. Um, there's uh, amazing kind of complexity to them. We feel like even though we analyze and study these organisms, we kind of scratching the surface on understanding them. Um, even within lichen, for example, there's, there's so many it's, it's a kind of um, microbiome, right? There's, there's so many other things that are happening microscopically within, within lichen. Um, so for, for us, there's, a, there's definitely an inspiration that we find within these systems, but it's also um, aesthetic. We, we try to kind of express some of the geometry and form that we are inspired by um, and make aesthetic decisions as, as designers as to um, how we, yeah, how we, how we express the material and how we design the, these different modules and assemblies. The second question, since the materials are porous, would it affect the waterproofing of a house? Yeah, so I think they, um, that's, a, that's another good question. Um, so when you fire it, clay, uh, we're talking specifically about clay, I think, with this material, but, or with this question. But when you fire clay at a high temperature, that reduces the amount of porosity. When you glaze at a, and fire at a high temperature, it begins to uh, repel water. Uh, so that's where a lot of tiles historically have been used to uh, waterproof buildings. Um, I think, I think for us there is um, that that does affect how a water a building is typically waterproofed. Um, but I think again, it's it's this idea of opening up questions or maybe rethinking some traditional ways that we have used ceramics, and how do we, you know, is it. Is there an opportunity to rethink the ceramics as, as a bioreceptive material? Um, so maybe there's a different agenda. Um, I think waterproofing is important, and 
necessary, but maybe there are, there's other opportunities or ways that we kind of revisit some of these uh, traditional ways of making with ceramics um, that that are more ecological and put biodiversity at the forefront, for example. Great. Oh, we have another question. You mentioned that uh, these tools are becoming more and more accessible all over the world. But however, how long do you think it will take for this technology to reach countries with less social and economic development to take advantage of it? Can you repeat that last part? I, I got the <laughs> first half. How long, how long do I think it will take what? How long do you think it will take uh, for this technology to reach countries with less social and economic development to take advantage of it? Yeah, I mean... That's a tough question. It's it's hard to uh, it's hard to know how long it might take. Um, I think I think there are one of the things that you know is I, I think important to me about the material, um, like clay, for example, or lichen, is that it's a, it's ubiquitous, right? It's a material that is found all over the world and has been used throughout architectural history uh, to design buildings, right? Um, so even at looking at architecture before architects, um, we can find examples of, of building with clay and earth structures um, in, in, in various cultures. And so I think there, there's a, a kind of material efficiency that's kind of built into that, I guess, question. It, it, it's available. Um, I think, you know, there's been a lot of advance, advancements even in the last 10 years, for example, right? If we just look back a decade, we're now starting to see a lot of things that were being speculated upon 10 years ago are being realized. So I think it's a very, um, you know, again, technology, I think, moves very fast. And uh, can, if any of you have read, read books by Ray Kurzweil, he kind of talks about its law of accelerating returns and this kind of exponential growth of technology. Um, and so I, I think, I don't think it, I, I think we're close to kind of applying this at a larger kind of scale. Great. I think we have got any more questions? I think we... Oh, we have one. <laughs> we will let you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, lots of good questions. That's great. So my question is, you mentioned like, the interconnectedness and the way that like, my city specifically grows. Um, so, like, walking with itself. And I'm just wondering if in the future we could use mycelium with um, like non-living materials like plastic, which we also see as yeah, I mean, so the mycelium, um, it's another great question. Um, you know, the mycelium needs food, basically, right? It needs nutrients to, uh, in order to grow. Um, I think there are ways that we could start thinking about how we use plastic along with other kind of nutrients that would allow mycelium to potentially break down plastic. Um, I think it would be a great area to research and, and I'm sure there's many, there, there's quite a bit of research that's happening with that already and looking at other kind of natural or organisms, natural systems and how they might begin to break down uh, plastic. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really have a, a clear answer on what that, what that, um, what that might be, what the nutrients might be, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question and I think it's an important one that we could start to expand and think about other ways of growing mycelium. I think this, this research is still, you know, even though we, I showed a slide with a lot of 
designers and scientists and artists that have been working on this type of work for a couple of decades. I think there's a, a kind of enormous kind of opportunity to kind of um, focus in on some of these um, questions and start to develop possibilities for how we might expand our uses of mycelium. That was fantastic. Uh, I think we covered a wide range of ideas. I truly enjoyed the conversation and I want to thank you so much for sharing your work with us today. Thank you everyone. And thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>